So, um, this is Tara Rizzi with AIA interviewing Peter Walker Hunt, um, AIA, past president and local architect. So, Peter, why don't we start with you just talking a bit about your personal background, um, your family, um, where you grew up, um, like that. Okay. Um, family has been important to me. I was born in Berkeley, California. Grew up in uh, Walnut Creek, which is in the east of San Francisco. And uh, at uh, age 10 or 11, moved to uh, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. My father had a government job and they transferred him there. Um, one of the reasons why I became an architect was I would visit my dad's office in downtown San Francisco, 32 floor building. And I would come home from those meetings right there in the financial center and uh, think, golly, how come I'd lay awake in bed at night think, why don't those floors fall down upon one another? How can such a building stand up? Uh, so I was very intrigued with that. And my mom would tell me that her father was a civil engineer. My mom was born in Peru. Uh, her parents lived in uh, Mexico. They met in Oaxaca, Mexico. And then they went to Nicaragua. And then they went to Peru. And then they moved to uh, Pittsburgh. Um, oddly enough, my grandfather's brother died in the, the flu epidemic uh, back then. And they um, went there to help take care of their family. And, and he moved to Washington, D.C., and got a government job in the uh, working for uh, one of the presidents. And uh, so in high school, I, I, I took architectural drawing classes, uh, as well as physics and biology and chemistry and uh, calculus and all that stuff. And I was very interested in that and on the track. Um, so architecture has always been of interest to me, as well as the cultural aspects of architecture. I'm, I'm extremely fascinated by uh, why we build such buildings and what shapes and for what reasons. Mm. And what brought, you to, Santa, <laughs> what brought <laughs> you to Santa Barbara? I, I came to Santa Barbara, I, mean, I graduated from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. And unbeknownst to me, I, I did what they used to call the grand tour. So I, I, I toured Europe upon graduating and then went through North Africa and was pretty fascinated by those ancient cities out there on the edge of the uh, Atlas Mountains in the desert. And, um, but also, you know, being 21 years old, I had to go to the Canary Islands to see what that was about. And then I went back down to Mexico and Central America um, to see where my uh, grandparents lived. And um, went back to Washington, D.C. and got a job in an architect's office a year and a half later. And th that, that guy I worked for, Fred Klein, said, well, he was Barry Burkus's main architect in, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And so I moved, to Santa, and I moved to Santa Barbara by chance. A bunch of friends of mine from high school were taking their time going through college. Can you imagine that? And they were going to UCSB. So I stopped and thought I'd spend the night here. And one night led to three nights. And they go, you know, why don't you just get a job in this town? So I got a job at Schmatt and Lindvik. Chuck Schmant and Ed Lendvik's place and started doing Sambo's restaurants and I think I did 107 of them in a, a period of time. We just crank them out. <laughs> Is so, that the same Sambo's that uh, recently changed their name down on Cabrillo? Okay. Right, right. Because I think the grandson uh, that was uh, Sam Battistone and somebody Bonnet, that's why they named it that. And of course that was very controversial in the name at the time. No, but we named it after ourselves, but nonetheless, it, it was a big deal in the early 70s. Yeah, well, that had a double meaning, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so you had friends in Santa Barbara, and that's how you were coming through town, and that's how you landed here. Uh-huh. Great. And so um, do you have any family here? Um, I have over 100 relatives that live in the Los Angeles area. Oh, wow, okay. Um, my father's sisters, my aunts, and my mom's sister, my other aunt, all moved to LA in the 1930s upon graduating from high school. My mom and dad were the youngest, uh, and, but their, their uh, brothers and sisters, had, well, all sisters in this case, all moved to LA because LA was happening in the 19th. And you know, if you were in the rest of the United States, uh, it wasn't happening. They had this pesky depression going on. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
So there was a lot of opportunity in Los Angeles, and consequently, I have actually have well over a hundred relatives in that area. Wow! And my dad, meanwhile, at World War II, my dad gets sent off to Europe and then off to the Pacific. Doesn't even get to stop at home and see my mom, and goes through the Pan Panama Canal. So she's living in L.A. during the war. <laughs> Crazy. So um, you talked a bit about how you decided to become an architect. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, in one of these pieces you sent me that um, you had a grandfather who was um, a civil engineer. Was mm -hmm. he part of the influence and in, um, do you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Direction? Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, uh, and my grandfather, uh, yeah, he grew up in uh, northern upstate New York. And uh, he got a chance to go to uh, a university that his mother had gone to. His mother actually had graduated from college in like 1875, which is very unusual in those days. But she happened to be related to the people that owned the college. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he went there and then he went to engineering school following that. And when he got out of, the he went to um, Michigan School of Mines. So he decided to become a mining engineer because there was jobs in mining. But immediately he gets a job in Niagara Falls because the first hydroelectric system is, is being built there and they're creating electricity. So he learns how to do that. And for a number of different reasons, he goes down to Mexico because there's a mine going on there. And my grandmother shows up in 1905 because she had been living in San Francisco and they had that earthquake and she's in a hospital working as a nurse and a week and a half later, the hospital burns down. Mm -hmm. And they meanwhile moved all the patients out into the park and they're taking care of it. And she's thinking, well, what am I going to do? Should I move back to Seattle? And uh, the Red Cross gives her all this money. So she decides she'll go visit her sister who's living in Oaxaca. And so she goes down anyway, they get married and then they move on to Peru and that's where my mom's born. Oh, cool. Right. So I, I was interested in that. I guess I, maybe it's in the genes. I like math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, can you talk a bit about your career? Um, it sounded like it started in um, Santa Barbara with Ed's, Ed Lenvik's firm. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of projects did you work on and how was it working in the early days in Santa Barbara? Uh, Santa Barbara, was, there was a lot more business orientation in the 70s than there is now, uh, or at least what was in the, uh, in the uh, particularly in the 90s. Uh, the no growth movement was just beginning to take hold. Um, and mainly for a kid who's 23, 24 years old, they want somebody that can draw and put together construction documents. So consequently, uh, I, I, I kind of, and you need to have a certain amount of experience to take the exam to be an architect. So I worked for Chuck Schmann, I worked for Ed Lenvik and then Chuck Schmann, and then I worked for Richard Taylor and Gil Berry, who I met in the office, and uh, uh, R.B. Nelson, Richard Bliss Nelson, and uh, Louis Mazzetti. And Louis Mazzetti was doing a lot of work for uh, Mike Tobes, so I got to meet Mike Tobes. And then, um, you know, I, I'm getting scattered, but I moved down to Orange County and worked on a hotel in Tehran. And this guy had built the hotel, the Princess Hotel in uh, Acapulco, a very famous pyramidal shaped building. And, uh, but then they had that revolution in Iran and all work ceased. So I moved back to Santa Barbara and worked for a guy, Bill Frizzell. And we did five hotels for Marriott, all 500 rooms or more. So it's kind of interesting. And by that time, I've passed the exam. I'm 29 years old uh, and I get my license at age 30. And so, hey, why not start my own company? <laughs> <laughs> and how was that, starting out on your own? Well, it was pretty meager. Uh, I think I was, um, one of my clients says, you know, I'm embarrassed to pay you $8 an hour. Would you just please charge me $10 an hour? <laughs> I mean, after all, you're a licensed architect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would meet people. And um, one of the first buildings we did, someone I knew, it was the old Normandy Hotel. It's right there at 27 East Victoria Street. And Tobes built his building next door in the old uh, Thompson Fosky Ford lot. But we redid that building. We, we actually owned it. 
and uh, ended up selling it for $300,000. It's still there and turned it into offices and, and did a bunch of things for it. So I started off doing that and would just meet people and do houses and such. And uh, it grew from there. Cool. And what are some of your uh, most memorable projects around Santa Barbara? Well, certainly the largest and, and one is the Alpha Resource Center which is on Cathedral Oaks, and that's this is the association. Well, it's, it's, it's for people with developmental disabilities, mm -hmm. and they started in the 50s. Um, people with developmental disabilities can be Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or a number of other things that are genetically, that happen to people, and so they don't develop as other human beings do. And <laughs> Sorry, I have a dog. Hey, Rusty. <laughs> Rusty the dog, <laughs> and uh, you see, Rusty knows. And <laughs> so, um, there were a number of people in Santa Barbara that got together. In those days, you they people with developmental disabilities would either be sent to an institution. And a lot of people didn't like that, they, they, uh, Camarillo or a Tascadero, uh, and and the people that are mentally ill. And so they wanted a place for for adults, and so they started what they called it the Alpha School in those days. And Bob Coleman, who was our supervisor for years and years, he was instrumental in getting that going. And the, he got a long-term lease on this 12 acres out there in Cathedral Oaks. And it's now been, what, 65 years, and uh, they're still going. And anyhow, the, the point is, in, in the Paint Cave Fire of 1990, um, 1989, 1990, the whole thing burns down and I get the job to redo the campus. And it was wonderful. Uh, and it was very extraordinary because part of the job was to raise money to, to reduce the cost of construction. And we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and using the architectural drawings to do that. It was quite remarkable and rewarding. Wow. It sounds like you have quite a personal um, relationship with that project and maybe the people out there. Um, I have a daughter with Down syndrome. So that, that's part of the reason why I met uh, many of the people involved. Um, but also prior to that, my wife was working for St. Vincent's and St. Vincent's was the institution that was taking care of children with Down syndrome. And whereas Alpha takes care of adults, because there's a lot of sympathy for children. They're cute, but adults, not so much. You know how we adults are. We're, you know, <laughs> grumpy and things like that. Not that kids are, but they're cute. Yeah. And so she had a lot of connections there. The St. Vincent's was also called the Daughters of Charity. And in those days, there was much less of a government involvement taking care of the, the, uh, the less fortunate society. So the church is... Uh, filled that role as they have for 500 years or more and so mm -hmm. consequently that was and is your, is your daughter still at the facility yes she, the she, she uh, not right now because of the pandemic but uh, but yes she's been going there for the past couple of years even though she's in her 30s now nice Mm -hmm. So um, Alpha Thrift is one of your biggest projects probably. Any other notable projects in Santa Barbara? Well, um, I, I had a client named Peter Kelsch and he uh, was a great client. So uh, with Peter, uh, one of the more memorable projects was, was the hotel in Summerlin. Now, I had experience with the hotels and uh, this is called the Inn on Summer Hill. And it's on Lily Avenue, and it's closer to Greenwell, closer to Carpentaria. There's another hotel in, uh, in Summerlin as well. And uh, I did a half a dozen buildings in uh, Summerlin um, as a result of that. Also, uh, next to the Nugget on the, uh, on the Carpentaria side, we went through that project for a number of years and got a coastal development permit, and they didn't want to build it sometimes buildings cost too much and they don't want to build it. So you ended up selling it to someone else who then took our coastal development permit and did a facsimile, a reasonable facsimile of our design, but certainly all of the, the planning uh, parts, parts had been worked out. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Tara, and as anybody who's an architect watching this, if anyone ever watches this, <laughs> um, th there's planning and architecture and planning 
is, you know, how much building are you going to build? Where is it going to be and why? And much of that is regulated by the zoning ordinance. And so you have to get a planning permit before you get a building permit. And when it's in the coastal zone, you have to get a coastal development permit. And it's, it's quite rigorous and more rigorous now than it was, I would say, back in the 70s when, it, when they first started. Right. So, okay. so um, maybe we can move on to talking about your time with AIA, because I know you were president and um, mm -hmm. on the board, obviously. And how was it in those early days? What year was that you were president? I was president in, in 2010, uh, okay. but I, I joined the AIA in 1990, and uh, 1980, oh. the years slipped by. <laughs> and um, the AIA, I, I, I feel strongly about colleagues and helping colleagues, but nonetheless, and, and it continues today in all sorts of businesses and in professional organizations, there's always gonna be a certain significant minority that views it more as competition rather than collegial. And particularly in the 70s, as a young buck, uh, uh, and in the 80s, the older guys, it was like, <laughs> whatever you can do, get rid of this guy, you know, uh, you know we don't want him around. He's, and and I, I was kind of like, well, that's unfortunate. But, um, but I was able to do a few things in the 1980s. And one was, uh, we did a, a, a charrette in 1985 because the city of Santa Barbara wanted to build a shopping mall downtown in competition to the Coomber Mall. And I don't know if everybody, any people, I'll recall the story for you real quickly. Um, this developer, Ernie Hahn, builds La Coomber Mall and it's not in downtown Santa Barbara. And suddenly the retail goes out to La Coombra and downtown becomes dead. So the city responds in two ways. One is they take the empty areas behind State Street and make them into parking lots. So they have automobiles can then park there for a reduced amount of money and then go to the stores. Then secondly, they take that area from Victoria Street down to uh, Gutierrez Street and they make it a mall and they eliminate parking on the street and make the sidewalks rather than five or 10 feet wide, 15, 20 feet wide and plant it with trees. Julio Mania was the, uh, was the uh, landscape architect. Robert Engel Hoyt, I believe, was the architect. Bill Mahan worked for him, and they did a lot of work, and it's been quite successful. And, but they weren't getting the revenue downtown that they wanted, and the downtown organization said, we need a department store downtown. And that went on for 10, 15 years. And they, so Fred Sweeney, who was the president of the AIA at the time, and a number of other guys, uh, like uh, Gil Berry and Bob Easton and Gary Jensen, we put on a charrette saying, well, where would this uh, sh shopping center be? We came up with a different location. We wanted to, we came up with a location that's more like Figueroa Street rather than um, below, but this, the city want, wanted it there near Delaguerre, right by City Hall, oddly enough. And, uh, <laughs> and so th that worked pretty well until recently. Um, so that uh, was Paseo Nuevo? The Paseo Nuevo was the, 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 the result of that. Mm. But we did our charrette and we had our involvement on it. A couple of years later, because I'm doing half a dozen or more projects in Summerlin and doing this hotel, the Inn at Summer Hill that I mentioned earlier, we were having a great deal of problems getting things to be built in Summerlin. They, they had a very, well, let's, let's say, a NIMBY attitude. And they didn't like the idea of anything being built that would... Uh, looked like it was, they said, what is, what is this, consumer land or summer land? <laughs> or summer, not slumber land, summer land or consumer. And so we put, we put on the charrette and, and they, it had a lot of run with the supervisors, particularly Jean Graffy, who was second district supervisor. She liked the idea of getting a community plan so then they could have a specific ordinance dealing with summer land, which is indeed what they have today. And as a result of that community workshop, the American Planning Association, the Santa Barbara chapter, awarded the AIA chapter an award, which I think I sent you a copy of. And um, so we So did. what was the project, I'm sorry, that you got the award for? It was called the Summerlin Planning Workshop. Okay. And I think I sent you a copy. Yeah. So email. it was for the workshop itself, not for a the final building. Itself. Okay, got it. And we did a lot of work, on, you know, for, in preparation, we went to public works. Uh, we looked at the creeks. We looked at the, talked to the fire department, we, we, sanitation district, all of those things that you do when you're doing city planning. 
Right. It's it's a side interest of my city planning. Right. And um, and and I guess it hasn't been so much of a professional interest. I, I had a, a professional interest in when I wanted to get these buildings built in Summerlin. Right. But following that, though, you may be aware in 2006, we did a workshop um, with the AIA and um, Paul Zink, Joe Andrelitis, um, Greg Reck, uh, some other former presidents. Um, we put on a workshop on what we called the, outer, the upper State Street area. And the city of Santa Barbara said, okay, we'd like to sponsor. So we put it on at, the, at a church over there in Lacumbro mall and that church has been torn down and they built the mark there and the idea was how can we get more um how can we get more uh, building and, and and apartment buildings or, or housing in the outer state street area but my, one of the pet things i had was well the difference between outer state street or upper state street is it doesn't have a grid pattern as opposed to downtown. Mm -hmm. So downtown has a grid pattern and that's one of the things that makes it charming and why today you you know, the latest charrette was, well, let's build four story buildings on state street because after all you like being on state street. Look, it has trees. There isn't any parking on the street and yet there is a street there. And what, one of my pet things on that, which didn't get picked up by the city was, how do you create a, a, a grid system in that area so that people can drive by and say, hey, is, that is the lure open today? Because I, I, I can't really get there or some shop that's in Lacumber Mall and, and other ways to get through downtown. Um, so, so what do you think should be done with Lacumber Mall? I mean, and what about the old Sears building? And it's like I, I, well, I, I think that in order to, to uh, make it uh, a more urban area, uh, one of the things, for example, the Sears building is a great place to have uh, a, a lot of housing. I mean, a fantastic view of the mountains, but it's directly adjacent to the freeway and there's the, the railroad on the other side. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine if there was a light rail that went from the airport and UCSB past Lacumbra all the way down to the railroad station and would go back and forth. So now you wouldn't get on the bus and you could get off right there, take a tunnel with maybe a conveyor belt or something, a, a people mover, and go underneath the freeway and get into the Lacumbra Mall with, uh, who knows, maybe 5,000 people living in, in buildings where, where Sears is and, and complete with shops. Now you have another vibrant area. And I think the only way you can really sell it to governmental officials is look at the tax revenue here because that seems to be motivating them. And you can see actually with this pandemic, with the shutdown of, of uh, commercial enterprises, they're losing a whole lot of money. And yet you and I are maybe taking a cut and pay, I certainly am, but they're not. Mm. Uh, and so what are they doing? Well, you know, I mean, they're doing the best they can, but, um, but maybe some new ideas would help. And, yeah. I, yeah. and obviously what to do in the Lacumbra area is certainly a long-term idea. Yeah. And yeah. my idea is only a small part. There are yeah. many, many more ideas. Right. And there is some new housing development on State Street up there now. Well, yes, that, that was one of the things that came out of that. That was the, uh, there was a, a hotel and a, um, and a restaurant uh, there. I forget the name of it all of a sudden. And they built the Franciscan, something like that. Right. It's right there across from the pizza place and the car wash. <laughs> so, um, Let's go back to AIA again. And um, what else was AIA kind of involved in in the early days? Do you remember? Well, uh, Tara, let me think about that. But, you know, one of the things that when I was president, what I was seeing that was going on was we had the, uh, the financial crisis when Lehman Brothers went down in 2008. And the result in 2009 was devastating to a lot of the economy. And a lot of people lost work and, and the economy wasn't doing well. And the AIA, as a consequence, uh, lost a lot of membership and the revenues weren't coming in. And in addition to that, we had, as an organization, had built up a lot of reserves and we had been giving away money through uh, from year 2000 up into the year 2007. And we were giving it to these different nonprofits, $1,000 here, $500 there, $2,000 there. And consequently, we had depleted our reserves and, and it wasn't doing well. We really couldn't pay our executive director. They had to take a huge cut of pay. And it wasn't, it, uh, we had other problems too that other members know about. Uh, so 
one of the things that we figured out to do was um, if we could involve, get something going where we involve the builders and suppliers, their local people that have lumber yards or sell doors and windows or plumbing fixtures and things like that, and put together some group where we could promote our businesses. And then we discovered that home tours are very popular with the public. So why don't we do a home tour? And so we did the home tour and, and, and I, I, I want to take credit for this idea because I came up with the idea, Architect Tours, the name, not the idea. The idea evolved uh, as with a group of us in the executive committee in those days. And the, the success was phenomenal. We had the Contractors Association coming to our meetings. There would be 20, 30, 40 of them showing up. They'd show up at the Christmas parties and we were promoting their business as well as our business. And uh, I, I have lost contact with architect tours in the past few years, been more interested in, in keeping my business going and that sort of thing. But it's ongoing and I think you could probably attest to the fact that it, it is still a source of revenue for the organization. It is and we had to um, cancel it this year for the first time since it started I think which was... Mm -hmm. which was and so thing. you're going to need an alternate way of uh, raising yeah. money. Exactly. So mm. that, that kind of addressed um, the, the issues, the challenges you were having financially at the time, architect tours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're probably well aware of that. And so, so there are other sources of income. And, and the Trident too, you know, the market will tell you what it wants. And, and that's what you got to look at, you know. So maybe I'll get back to you on that if I have any. Any ideas, yeah. <laughs> yeah, small or large or whatever. It'll have to be um, online ideas. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, the AIA in the 70s yeah. and the 80s, they would have an annual roundtable, which is similar to what you, you do now. With and a general meeting. Pardon? We call it a general meeting now, that one? Well, the, the roundtable was once a year, usually in January. Uh, I think the, now the executive board has their retreat in January. They, oh, I see, yeah. And but in those days, they would invite, they, they had the, the uh, executive board meetings were more closed and they didn't invite, you know, small time architects such as myself to those meetings. Um, but, uh, but at the round table, people would talk and discuss and exchange ideas and what would be good for business or the community. Mm. So everyone was invited to those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And who was the president in those days, do you remember? Well, every year there was a different president. Yeah. John Pittman served uh, I think three or four times. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sure Ed Lindvik was president uh, once. Perhaps Dave Jones, Dave Jones, um, Fred Sweeney. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember. Okay. Tommy Lenny, Brian Cornell. Well, okay. All right. Anything else about um, when you were president and the AIA? Where was the office at that time? So, um, you know, Pierre, Le, Pierre Clayson's, uh, but prior to Pierre, uh, who is an interesting story in and of himself, um, prior to that, the office was on Anacapa Street in that there's an old brick building there that uh, is now brick. I think it had been in Adobe previously uh, near, near Canon Perdido. Mm -hmm. And uh, next to the, uh, the large building that uh, Julia Morgan designed back in the, uh, you know, 1920 or so. Um, but it's closer to Cana Perdido Street. And interestingly enough, my office was on the other corner. Uh, the building's been subsequently torn down on the corner of Cana Perdido and Santa Barbara Street in the Presidio. And um, so I would go by there a lot. And Julio Vanya lived in the adobe behind it. And uh, so it was, oh, you've got a much better place now. To, yeah. to, uh, <laughs> and you know the story of Pierre and, and how- Yeah, but what, why did you tell it for the record? So I, I can tell you more and more of an apocryphal story when I know about Pierre. Uh, he, he was an architect, he was from Belgium, and, and he practiced in Lompoc, and he had some somewhat interesting projects. But late in life, he meets the widow of the guy who had started Seaside Oil Company. And in Santa, Seaside Oil Company was the local oil company. And as you know, the channel was filled with oil. And, and there are oil slicks. At least there are a lot more in those days than there are now. And, and they've, they've capped them to, to a certain extent. And so he made a lot of money uh, drilling that oil and, and distributing it to the public. And one of the big things he did was um, he, he put up a lot of the money to build the Santa Barbara 
courthouse, the county courthouse, the one that's there on, uh, you know, on Anacapa Street and Anapamu. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, late in life, um, I'm trying to remember her name right now. But anyway, Pierre meets her and uh, they get married and they're married for a number of years and she dies. And so he's left with a lot. Usually the story's the other way around. The man dies and the woman lives and then she and, and so anyway, he had a, a chunk of change. Her daughter, Cynthia Woods, uh, gets a good portion of it. Um, but he had two things that he wanted to leave the money to. One, as a veteran, uh, he was from Belgium. He, he left the money to the veterans and they still use that money well. And he left the other money to the uh, AIA. The AIA at the time, Fred Sweeney and Ed Lendrick were, and John Pittman were highly involved. I'm just peripherally involved, but, but I would read the stuff. They said, well, look, as, as the, the, the way the or AIA is organized, we can't take the money directly. So we need to create a foundation. So the foundation can take the money. But the AIA neglected to take control of the foundation, and that's the you know there, there's this sort of this rub that goes on all the time, and so consequently there are not enough architects on the foundation, nor are they AIA architects necessarily, and they don't have the same interests as the AIA has. So there's something uh, ongoing that needs to be worked out, and I would say to anybody that's an AIA architect, you know, get involved with the foundation because. Um, it can be tenuous at times. Yeah, and so the donation was given to the AIA who set up the architectural foundation to receive it and the house that was part of that, they bought the house at that time as part of the donation, correct? Yeah. Yes. And that's where the offices are for AIA and the, the architectural foundation right now. Right there in Victoria and um, Santa Barbara Street. Right, right? yep. Mm -hmm. In, uh, yeah. Great location. Yeah, it's a beautiful old house. Mm -hmm. are, are you at home or are you in that house now? No, I'm at home. Yeah. That's called the Atchison House, correct? The, uh, the yes. AIA house. Yeah, I guess that's the name of a family that used to live there or... I don't Makes know. Sense. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Yeah, interesting history. We're lucky to have that um, location. Is the Junior League still upstairs? They are, yeah. Yeah. Somehow they got into that deal too because they're a fundraiser and they do a lot of... Uh, good things in the community. Yeah. Well, it works well for them because the gallery serves as a meeting space and uh, mm -hmm. it's, they have the whole of the upstairs and obviously they pay rent as we do to the architectural foundation. So. It'd be nice, you know, you would think as, as architects, uh, all the years I was on the board, I was thinking, well, why can't we create another entrance for the, uh, you know, it would be the back door, but the, the junior league would walk through our meetings oh, and yeah. go upstairs. I'm thinking, you know, like you'd think maybe there'd be some architects, you know, yeah. that, but there wasn't any money, right, to, to yeah. do, you know, then you'd have, you know, but it's a great project. Maybe one of the young people there uh, can figure that out. Yeah. So it yeah. wouldn't be hard. It's They've done tougher problems. It's not a well-used building right now, as you can imagine. Right. With the pandemic, you know, uh -huh. and I'm working from home. I'm not even down there myself. So, so who does go in to uh, turn on the lights and lock well, the doors? Well, Rocio is the executive director of the Architectural Foundation right now. She's working down there. I uh -huh. have to work through her off, walk through her office to get to my office, as you know. Um, so, and then Joan is working upstairs. She's the executive director of Junior League. Uh -huh. so those two are working, and both of them are part time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's, uh, and I've often thought the, uh, the patio on the, uh, on the State Street side of the building would make an excellent uh, meeting room. And, um, and, and being in a, um, a commercially developed area, uh, it, it could be on the same level as the floor of the building. And uh, you, we could see uh, so many more people there and it wouldn't, you wouldn't be walking, people wouldn't be walking through right. the meeting room in order to get to the meeting room. Yeah, because yeah. Now the meeting room would be more of a gallery. Right. Um, and, and, and I always wondered, you know, I'd just sit there during those meetings, just, you know, just imagine it. And I'm like, God, you know, there, there are hundred members of the AIA and, but I've never actually said anything to anybody about that. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know as architects, you know, your mind wanders and, and, and you're thinking three-dimensionally about what could happen here and there. Yeah, yeah. Where's the money? Who's the client? You know? <laughs> it is nice to have those outside spaces so for, you know, receptions and because mm -hmm. uh, the climate's so nice here in Santa Barbara. Yeah, I mean, you could have a re retractable tent, if nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
So anything else you want to talk about your architectural career or the AIA or? Yes, I would. One of the questions you asked me was, uh, one of the things, um, looking at my notes here, I, I wanted to talk about architectural styles because styles change a lot mm -hmm. and, and they're trends. And um, anybody that studied architecture, you probably are aware of this too. Um, in Santa Barbara, the, the buildings that were built around the turn of the century, this is the 19th, the 20th century, were Victorian style buildings. You know, and prior to that, there were the adobes. And then with the Balboa Exposition in 1915 in San Diego, they said, hey, why don't we create this ersatz Spanish colonial style in Southern California? And that took root in uh, San Diego and, and parts of Los Angeles. And by the time the 1925 earthquake, came along, they said, well, why don't we do that in Santa Barbara? And they had some uh, pretty good success on that. And, uh, but then the, the international style comes along and the, that's a modern style from Europe, flat roofs, uh, lots of glass, things like that um, in the 1930s. And the modernism, and, and because of the modern materials, what happens in Santa Barbara, many of the buildings kind of morph into stucco, white stucco, tile roofs, but more modernistic styles. There are a number of very extraordinary mid-century modern buildings in Santa Barbara, particularly designed, in my opinion, by Albert Dothy. Most people don't know who he is, but I had the good fortune of working with him. Um, the what, Jolly Tiger. What has he built in Santa Barbara? Well, he designed the, the Jolly Tiger over there in oh, Canada, okay. you know, and and um, you know, Dilly, Delgare and Chapala. He did the old El Prado Motel, which is now La Quinta. Uh, he did a, a, a church out on a Modoc, um, a bunch of other ones. Um, Albert was just, <laughs> and he had, had actually met Le Corbusier and had an autograph from him. And, um, but anyway, his stuff is interesting. But what was going on by and large in Santa Barbara were, were these modernistic ideas within the context of uh, the red tile roof and white plaster in order to get it approved by in those days the planning commission um, and the avr but they created the hlc the historic landmarks committee because of the el pueblo viejo and they wanted to make certain that they could recreate this, uh, the vision of the spanish colonial city it's, it's it, it was good for tourists right. and uh and so that was really the trend in the 80s and 90s but of course if, when you're going to architecture school you want to be a modern architect and do things that are new and different. And that's certainly the trend now. And you couple that with these incredibly, incredib very interesting building materials that are being made uh, in, in response to climate trend, in response to uh, uh, rain screens in the exterior of the buildings, um, using uh, inorganic materials on roofs so the roofs we don't we can take it well beyond 20 years we can go to 40 to 60 years on the roof material and and those sorts of things um, in addition to the stylistically so now we're seeing modern buildings uh, in many respects they are in my opinion they are mid-century modern revival <laughs> and in other respects they're truly contemporary buildings so i just wanted to throw a little note out there that by the time if anybody ever looks at this, they'll go, well, yeah, that's kind of old hat, but right. that's just the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, and the, you mentioned earlier, you're interested in the culture of architecture. That's kind of along those lines, right? Exactly. Yeah, and even it came up in the um, meeting yesterday um, with equity and diversity about the history of architecture mm -hmm. you know, in America and in Santa Barbara and the colonial and the settlers and we have a very polycultural society yeah. and you know, it's just not European. There are just all sorts of people from all over. Last fall, I had the opportunity, uh, opportunity of a lifetime. I went on a tour of Egypt, two weeks, um, went to lower Egypt and upper Egypt. You know, lower Egypt, as you know, is where the pyramids are and the ancient city of Memphis and upper, G upper Egypt is where Luxor and uh, the Valley of the Kings and Karnak mm -hmm. and, uh, 
they, they start, that civilization starts about 5,000 years ago. And what creates the civilization is they have a food surplus and, and that's because the Nile would flood every year and inundate and then these plants would miraculously, miraculously grow and you could harvest them and you have a food surplus. And when you have a food surplus, you've got time on your hands. And in addition, in Egypt, during the inundation, during the flood, you can't farm for three months. Well, the oldest big buildings in Egypt are the pyramids. And those were done in the, in the, in the early period, um, about 4,500 years ago. And how were they able to do that? As near as I could tell, and I've done a lot of studying of it, they didn't really have a taxing system. And I'm thinking they probably had a plantation society where you worked on the harvest and you did that and you got fed and you got free health care and you got all these other things and they protected you from what they called the people to the east were called Asiatics and they would periodically invade, they'd keep them away and they built these pyramids. Consequently, Egypt has a run of about 3,000 years. But about 4,000 years ago, they invent, they don't invent it, but in Mesopotamia, which is what we now know as Iraq, where those rivers are, they invent the taxing system. And the quid pro quo is we will tax you and in return, we will protect you. Mm -hmm. So the whole basis of taxing is you give us money and we will make certain that you won't be invaded by foreigners and we'll have a police force. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the first things in the constitution, the US constitution. Right. We raise money, protect you from foreigners. Right. Yeah. But it, nothing's really changed there. Right. But you get away from the plantation system, don't you? Yeah. It's yeah. an advancement. Yeah. Well, it's protect you from foreigners, but it's also make sure you have enough to eat, take care of your medical concerns and, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, and protect you from diseases. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, um, we've kind of come to the end of the questions. If there's anything else you want to discuss or it's... Uh, well, I, I, anybody that's watching this, I would really encourage any architects or other people to get involved with the AIA. There's, there's a, a lot of very rewarding things there for your career and the, uh, and the profession in and of itself and uh, to get to know your colleagues and, and work with them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Peter. I'm just going to turn off the recording. Okay.